In the face of the struggle for racial justice, many of us are stepping out of traditional comfort zones. That includes one high-profile magazine. Mark Whitaker is our newest Sunday morning contributor. Vanity Fair, the glitzy 107-year-old magazine, might be best known for great reads and great photography, chronicling Hollywood and high society. But how does a publication that bills itself as capturing the cultural zeitgeist react to a moment like this? I felt when I took the title over that the, the culture really was moving very strongly in a direction that was more diverse. Radhika Jones became Vanity Fair's editor-in-chief in 2017. I think as an editor, you know, you're always hoping to see around the corner. So what made you think that ta was the person who could kind of help you create something really new and distinctive? Well, ta has been seeing around corners for his whole professional life. If you are attempting to study American history and you don't understand the force of white supremacy, you, you fundamentally misunderstand America. You just Earlier this year, Jones tapped best-selling author ta Coates to guest edit a special issue of Vanity Fair on newsstands next month. It features contributors of color on almost every page. So what did it feel like to be the boss? Well, I mean, I'm ridiculous the boss. <laughs> you know, to be clear about that. Um, I was lending an assist. Arguably America's preeminent voice on race, Coates burst onto the national scene as a national correspondent for The Atlantic. For every nickel of wealth that the average black family has, a white family has a dollar. His 2014 cover story, The Case for Reparations, revived a national dialogue about the issue, with Coates even testifying before a congressional panel on reparations last year. Uh, enslavement is theft. 250 years, black people had the fruits of their labor stolen from them. And his landmark book, between the World and Me, written as a letter to his son about the dangers of being a black man in America, has sold more than two and a half million copies. It skyrocketed back onto many bestseller lists this summer in the wake of George Floyd's killing. Toni Morrison compared you to James Baldwin. <laughs> that must have been a pretty heavy. Yeah, it was, um, it felt like somebody handed me a responsibility. I mean, obviously I was flattered, praised, it was, you know, I was, enormously humbled, but um, I felt like it was a charge. Like somebody said, okay, now you have to, you know what I mean, go and fulfill that. Right. Because if you don't, you're gonna be the guy that made Toni Morrison wrong. Right. How would you like that? Right, right. You want that to be your legacy? Right. And I don't. The issue is called The Great Fire. Inspired by a poem about white Chicagoans in the early 20th century, who saw the influx of African Americans as a disaster akin to the fire that nearly destroyed the city 50 years earlier. Coates writes about it in a powerful editor's letter. It's interesting, the metaphor, because at the beginning of the letter, the fire is a threat. Yes, it's seen as destructive. By the end, it, it, its greatest power is illumination. And you know, what I argue in the piece, that's always been you know, the, the great power of the black movement. I mean, what is so horrifying about seeing Emmett Till's you know, open casket that it illuminates something brutal about the country? What is so horrifying about seeing John Lewis charged and beaten and you know, folks gassed for wanting to cross a bridge? It illuminates something that we do not like, something um, that is um, not consistent with how we see ourselves as a country. Same thing with these cell phones. I mean, it's not like this is new, but suddenly it's illuminated, you know, and people can see it. And it, it absolutely drives folks who don't even experience it crazy. It's hard to look at that and not do anything. The cover is a portrait of Breonna Taylor, the 26-year-old Louisville woman who was shot and killed in March by police in her own apartment. It was painted by acclaimed artist Amy Sherald. Sherald's best known work is the Michelle Obama portrait that hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. At a time when sales of print magazines are down, Jones hopes this issue becomes that increasingly rare commodity, a keepsake. And as a child of a mother born in India, she takes her responsibility as a cultural gatekeeper seriously. 
You can use the gate to keep people out, or you can use the gate to let people in. And that's, for me, what's been behind this project. It feels so magical to me at this incredibly difficult and strained time in American history to have been able to do that. ta Coates, who will now join Vanity Fair as a contributing editor, is not known for his optimism about race. But in the multiracial faces of today's protesters, he sees reason to believe that this time might be different. One of the things that people have said about your work is that you offer a powerful indictment of the state of race relations in our country, but you don't ultimately offer solutions or reason for hope. And yet, in your editor's letter, you actually do see hope in this current moment. I have very little, again, I just want to be clear about this, I have very little expectation that the powers that be in Louisville, in Kentucky, will ultimately hold the people that killed Breonna Taylor accountable. I am um, filled with a transcendent, transcendent sense of, I would actually call it joy, when I see the people who continue to struggle in her name nonetheless. And maybe we are, we're, we're at a moment where some kind of critical mass of people in this country, beyond the community that's actually being affected by it, you know, actually, you know, can, can see some things that they couldn't see before.